When I was in college, I finally felt ready to begin speaking with someone about adoption. So I went to the counseling center on campus and they handed me the medical form to fill out in the waiting room, but I just put a big slash across the entire piece of paper and wrote, I am adopted and I don't know my medical history. The first thing out of the therapist's mouth was, it's so nice to meet you. And it's so neat that you were adopted. You must have some really great parents. Now, in an alternate history, I responded to the therapist by saying that her assumptions about my parents and my adoption makes it very hard for me to be honest with her. But in reality, I sat there for the rest of the hour, smiling and nodding, knowing that I would not be coming back. I'm Angela Tucker, and welcome to The Adoptee Next Door, where I interview adoptees about living the adopted life. I'm going to launch in with a very stark reality about adoptees and mental health. In reference to people who go to therapy, the American Academy of Pediatrics found that the odds of a reported suicide attempt were four times greater in adoptees compared with non-adoptees. This is quite sobering. And just to be clear, we will not be talking directly about suicide in this episode. But once I heard that stat, I knew we needed to be having a broader conversation about mental health. And I couldn't think of anyone better to have that conversation with than Jesenia Palmer. The number one thing I think of is that I better be quiet and I better not be honest anymore. I better just play that grateful role. And then when, what happens is when we focus on being grateful or being that happy adoptee, we're not really healing. And a lot of us have a lot of healing work that needs to be done. Jesenia is an adult adoptee in reunion with her birth family. She has publicly shared about overcoming adoption traumas, including abandonment, suicidal thoughts, separation anxiety, and depression. Jesenia is laser focused on mental health for adoptees on her social media platforms and is seen by many as a leader in this area. The short end of it for my work is adoption and mental health, but it's really adoption, mental health, and wellness. Um, and I think the wellness part is the most important thing. And I think also on the other side is really important for us to identify the trauma in, adopt in adoption and in adoptees experience. And I think once we're able to identify that adoption is trauma, it's at that point that we can work together as in a community, which takes adoptees, adoptive parents, um, mental health professionals, and birth parents, birth mothers as well, all of us to work as a collective so that we can have wellness in yes. adoptees. So in tell, adoptees me about, tell me about wellness as an adoptee. What does that mean? Wellness in, as an adoptee, it means having, everybody having a practice, whether it is um, self-care, and everybody can define self-care as something different. It can mean yoga, it can mean reading, it can mean nature, bike rides, uh, journaling, music. Um, it can mean a number of different things. It's wherever you feel safe and wherever you feel like you could be your true authentic self. So I was going to be different ask for about that because I hear that thrown around a lot, like to be your true authentic selves. But I think for adoptees, sometimes we don't know what that is. Right, right. Yeah. So it takes work. And I think there's a huge misconception when it comes to self-care that it's supposed to be easy. And it's not always going to be easy. There's going to be times where it's challenging because when we sit in silence and we really start as adoptees to have those conversations with ourselves about who am I and what do I believe of myself and of my family and of my future and my present, like, um, those are tough questions for us to ask. And for many of us, including myself still, um, even in reunion, it's, it's a constant practice every day where I've got to sit with myself. I try to spend at least five to 10 minutes a day um, with affirmations and, you know, like, like your mantra that you got, that you have that I just absolutely love, um, just sitting with that and see yeah. what naturally flows out of myself. But if we don't allow ourselves to sit with our feelings and our thoughts, we'll never be able to discover what it means to be ourselves or to get ourselves on a journey to self-discovery. 
when you are practicing wellness, whatever that is for you, for me, I think, for me, I would say it's probably right now gardening. I never mm-hmm. thought this would be the thing, but I put my phone on airplane mode so I have no texts, no emails, nothing coming in except for my music or a podcast that is something like psychologically stimulating, but not about adoption usually. And I think at that time though, my thoughts still meander towards thinking about my birth mother. Like, is she thinking about me? And in ways of, I'm usually thinking like, does my birth mom like gardening? Like I just, even though I'm in reunion, I know her, I'm in this space. I think that would happen no matter what my chosen wellness would be. Like if it was yoga, if it was baths, my thoughts would still meander over to like the, who am I? Where did I come from? My roots and stuff. So does that, would that count? Definitely. Yeah. It doesn't mean, like I said, wellness and mindfulness and self-care, it's not always pretty. And it's going to cause us in that stillness while we're doing gardening or yoga or whatever it might be um, to go into those mental spaces where we're like, does my mom like this? Does my family do this? Um, am I like them? Do I, am I doing this because of that? Or, you know, so many different questions and that's okay. That's totally okay. It's natural. And when I think of my story, there were so many things that I would do as self-care and I grew up doing like music and my birth family did the same thing. So it's, it's interesting. And it's not just me. I've heard so many stories. I've heard yeah. this too. I recently saw, do you know Ferreira Swan on, um, yeah. Love so her. I recently yeah. saw something she wrote about music saying that she's always like covered this certain song. And when she met her bi- biological yeah. brother, he covered yeah. that song all the time as well. I love that. I actually <laughs> have, like, a part in my book that's coming out about this, about the things that like aren't the typical genetics that people, other people, non-adoptees talk about, like your hair color, your eye color, your bone structure, but that there are other pieces that when we find that like genetic mirroring, it's so powerful. And especially when it's those other activities and hobbies and just like quirks and mannerisms for sure. Yeah. I remember when I talked to one of my brothers, um, this is years ago. And when he was telling me about his upbringing, I was like, oh my God, me too. Like, how is it that we live two completely separate lives, but we love the same things. We experience a lot of the same things yet, because we always say like adoption doesn't always give you a better life. It gives you a different life yet. We've lived very similar lives, two different parts <laughs> of the world. So it's so crazy how that happens. Yes. Let's talk about that better life thing that is so prevalent that adoptees say to, um, but certainly society, like, oh, you got a chance at a better life. Where do you think that statement, whether we actively try to push against it and think, you know, not a better life, it's a different life, which is what my parents would tell me as well. But just knowing that that's the societal view, like where does that hit in terms of our psychological health, our mental health? I think it puts pressure on us to live that better life and not live in our truth. Because um, ever since I started my Instagram page recently with um, focusing on mental health, I've been receiving so many messages. And even when I did my video about suicide, there's so many people that have related to me and they have expressed that they thought they had a better life. But the more that they hear these stories from all of us, it's, it's like an awakening. They are coming out of the fog and they're realizing that their entire lives, they try to fit themselves in that narrative of having a better life. But the reality is, is that it's just been different. Practically everyone I know, adopted or not, looks back at their life and thinks, what would have become of my life had I chosen to attend a different college? Or if I married so-and-so? Or taken that job in Philadelphia? You get the point. (laughs) But adoptees are the only people group I can think of where our fantasies aren't fueled by a simple and harmless curiosity 
but instead our adoption is a constant reminder that we actually would have been a completely different person. After meeting my birth family in my mid-20s, I began visualizing myself and that different life that I would have had. Would I have bickered with or become best friends with my biological sister? Would I have learned to play classical piano? Would The Sound of Music had been my favorite movie? I definitely wouldn't have married or even have met Brian. <laughs> But the reality is, is that it's a false equivalency to try to measure the things that I've achieved in this adopted life with the things that I might have achieved if I'd stayed with my birth family. I think when I was younger, I was angry. I was really hurt, but it, it came out to being angry every once in a while because I didn't understand what it meant to be an adult and make those tough decisions where um, mothers end up abandoning, abandoning their children or placing their children for adoption. And so when we talk about having a better life, my mom struggled. I don't know too much about her. I have met her, but, but I know she's had a very difficult life. Yeah. So when I think about having a better life in which I only had a slightly better life with my adoptive family. Um, I can't help but have my heart ache for whatever my birth mother went through. So it's really hard for me to focus on having a better life. Yeah. I think it's hard because she struggled. And as an adult, it could happen to any one of us, any one of us. And I don't want anybody to, <sighs> I just think about it and I just get so upset about it because it's not a better life when someone, ha when our birth mothers lost so much and when we've lost so much. It's, it's like the adoption piece is, is so, it's an unfortunate cause and effect because yeah. the, the places that my birth mom, perhaps your birth family, others that I know, the things they're struggling with, which are typically like, what others view as like the societal ills, like things we just don't even want to mm -hmm. see and they're not getting support with that, that it's really difficult to see how that has anything to do with us as their children because yeah. they love their kids. But the fact that they mm -hmm. can't care for us at this time then leads yes. us to a lifelong curiosity of like, was I wanted? When in reality, yeah. it has so little to do with that usually. Mm -hmm. I think one of the biggest gifts I had received in life was being able to um, be a part of birth mother groups or first mom groups to get a better understanding of what they've oh, gone through. Wow. Like once I heard their stories, I felt like a sigh of relief, like a, a part of healing began for me because I was like, it just never crossed my mind being adopted that my mom struggled or what that struggle looked like that she had to make that decision and whether it was out of love or not but it's always usually <laughs> about love you know it's just des she's she was desperate I wanted to play a video clip for Jasenia of an interview I did for the Adopted Life episode in New York City back in 2017. In this clip, a 14-year-old Korean adoptee talked to me about his intense longing to know his birth family and how at times his adoption made him question his own right to exist. And so you seem to be one who you know, you, you think a lot about those yeah, early times. I do think a lot. At, um, if I were to count, I would say around at least two to three times every day. Two to three thoughts each uh, two day. Or three, like, no, segments of thoughts. Like maybe I ask myself like five questions every single time. So that's around, that's a lot actually. It's a lot I think of time that you're spending on thinking about like how you got here, why yeah. you're here. Yeah. What are some of your trains of thoughts and um, do you do you verbalize them with family or I verbalize them to a mirror actually mainly or, or a wall in my room because I mean coming out about my adoption isn't exact I mean when I do it's not always like the most my most happy times and uh, I'm not always very comfortable when I'm talking about 
um, a, adoption, especially if I'm talking to someone who doesn't completely understand, like mm. if I'm talking to one of my friends. It's hard to do that when general thought about adoption is like, oh my gosh, you were adopted. Mm. Like, how do you meet someone when they say it like that to uh, you and you're feeling like, yeah, I was <laughs> adopted. And it's like, yes, I was adopted. Uh, anything else? <laughs> I try to, res to, um, lo to kind of lower my voice to make it seem a bit more quiet and calm to de-escalate their kind of uh, positive um, intensity that they have in them because I, I honestly don't really like that. Um, yeah. They're like, oh my God, you're adopted. Yeah, I'm just like, oh yes, I, I was adopted. Uh, I'd rather not get into the good and the bad of that right now, but yes, That's I good was that adopted. you can say that. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I know, right? I just felt like my chest getting extremely tight <laughs> listening to that. Oh my gosh. I don't know who this young man is, but he articulates himself so well. At 14 uh, years old. And yes. Yeah, I mean, he was, he's so poignant when I followed up. You know, so you, you think about adoption like two or three times, and he was so emphatic on correcting me like no not not two or three times like two or three yeah. segments of thought yeah and you know what i got from that was the fact that he really spends a lot of time on this because he's been able to develop his mind develop the vocabulary and the courage to talk about that whether it's just with himself or with other people or you like he has truly spent a large portion of his time and of his day thinking about this so when people think that kids or adoptees don't think about being adopted every day like this is our life this is our world we think about this all the time but that all we might do it behind a closed door in our yeah. bedroom in our talking to our walls in the bathroom talking to the mirror right. and then yeah. we run off and we do the societally pleasing thing to do which is to be that good adoptee and to, yeah. to look well adjusted he reminds me so much of myself, so, so much. I used to talk to my mirror almost every day, and a couple times a day. My thoughts, my sadness, my anger, I would just look at myself. And there's like a moment I'll never forget where I literally just stared in the mirror and just grabbed my hair like as hard as possible, just like, ah, and just scream so loud because I was just so angry and so frustrated because I didn't have answers. and. Um, I can probably recall many a times when people were like, oh, you're adopted? And it's like, I did the same thing. Like my voice completely dropped. And obviously I did it purposely because I wanted that person to know, like, ah, there's nothing to really be excited about, you know, because the majority of people don't know, society, does, society doesn't know that there's loss involved or the trauma involved. I mean, there are... I mean, knowing what I know now about my birth family, there is a lot for me to be thankful for, as hard as it is to say. I was going to um, ask, like, the way you say that, uh, your whole body kind of tenses up. <laughs> thankful? Yeah, I'm terrible. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if you're wondering why we're both laughing, it's because Jasenia and I both know that no matter how old we are as adoptees, general society will always ask us, either directly or indirectly, if we are grateful or thankful to be adopted. And this question is the absolute worst. Because although being adopted may have spared us some harm, for me it also felt like I was a puzzle with tons of missing pieces. So am I grateful or thankful to be adopted? That is truly an impossible question to answer, and it is one of the toughest concepts for non-adopted people to understand. Because if you're not missing so many pieces of your life story, then the choice for you is obvious. You'd choose the option devoid of any harm or loss. The amazing thing now that a lot of adoptees, I think it's because a lot of us older adoptees are talking about mental health and therapy and our experiences being adopted. Now they're more inclined and inspired to seek 
therapy when I'm like, oh yes, thank you, because I want everybody to live their best lives. So, um, but the problem we're having is that we don't have enough brown and black therapists that are adoption trauma informed. And so like a lot of therapists have reached out to me lately that um, check those boxes and I'm like, oh, would you be interested? Does this move you in any kind of way? You know, I can send you in the right direction to get this training. Like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're like a hot commodity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which like, goes into a lot of the discussions we're having right now about defunding the police. And like, I think defunding child welfare is another, is right up there mm-hmm. because the the pipeline, the going back to what, who schools are admitting into their master's programs seem yeah. to be well-intentioned white women. Yeah. It's not even yeah. very many men. I think it's, and so like the reason we don't have black and brown therapists at the same rate that we do white therapists goes back and we need to fix that whole system. But then the adoption piece is unique. And why is yeah. that one left out? Yeah. It's because that predominant narrative that there's not a problem that adoption is just this beautiful thing. So it's like, it literally in the past two weeks, I can't tell you the amount of psychologists and mental health therapists that reached out to say, wow, your page. I never knew. I had no idea. Like it's insane to me, the amount of mental health therapists and psychologists and psychiatrists that we have that have absolute no idea that adoption is trauma, that adoption can be problematic or the loss that's involved, (laughs) like zero idea about this. Like it's been eye opening. It isn't just that there's a new generation, people our age who are talking about it because there's actually been people older than us who've been talking about it too. The difference I think is we're starting to accept nuance, nuanced Mm -hmm. uh, identities in lots of different ways, being open to uh, gender non-conforming people to transgender to um, non-binary being even not in that category even just being open to like I think about Issa Rae and how she mm-hmm. normalized like black nerds or yeah. you know I think perhaps the generation before us that was speaking about this stuff but not mm-hmm. being heard were just seen as too angry. And so for yeah. us, I think we've learned how to walk that line to help appease people by saying like, mm-hmm. yeah, there's some good about adoption and going that direction a little bit. And then also very slowly being like, and also there's, there's a lot, like, <laughs> let's think about <laughs> just being removed from your birth parents arms. Like, what does that mean? And, but I, that is a, that's a lot of energy just to have to yeah. learn how to play the game, basically, <laughs> so that we're not seen as just angry and written off like the whole generation before us was. I was telling someone the other day, I'm really outspoken, like in real life, <laughs> and I just tell it how it is, however it rolls off my tongue. But <laughs> today, in dealing with everything that we're dealing with, when it comes to adoptive parents, I have to give realness and a dosage a little bit here or weave it in a little bit in here because otherwise I'm, like what uh, do you mean by dealing with what we're dealing with with adoptive parents what do you mean by that why do we um, have to give it in little doses specifically <laughs> to white adoptive parents yeah because i'm the angry person I'm just angry or I had a bad experience like i get really offended when people tell me i had a bad experience um because whether it was a bad experience or not, that's not the point. It's there's so many challenges involved in adoption and that are all worthy and need to be explored. Like we can't just focus on the positive because though there are positives, there's still a lot of baggage or loss or trauma that needs to be worked through. If we're really going to talk about wellness and mental health and adoptees. And um, it reminds me of this blog post I wrote once where I think I said like, you know, stop comparing people's traumas, stop yes. comparing adoptees' traumas. Like, okay, Jasenia had this kind of abuse in her adoptive family, so therefore she's this degree of angry. I'm raising yeah. my child without any of that sort of abuse, and so 
let's just disregard what she says, that kind of thing. When in reality, the, the first trauma of being removed from your birth parents' arms is, is huge. Yeah. No matter what happens after that. And so, yeah, I think there does seem to be a ranking. Yeah. And if you look at the comments, like on my social pages, sometimes I feel like just, oh, like, just a little bit sad because when you see the adoptees that'll, that'll comment, at the, oh, I had a positive experience. I don't feel any loss. I don't, 35 likes, 45 likes. Oh, the yeah. person that had a bad experience, two likes. Like, right. And they're both by adoptees. <laughs> so right. Like, what, but. what message are we sending out to these adopt, to the, to adoptees? I, the number one thing I think of is that I better be quiet and I better not be honest anymore. I better just play that grateful role. And then when, what happens is when we focus on being grateful or being that happy adoptee, we're not really healing. And a lot of us have a lot of healing work that needs to be done. And so it's like, I, I would really love for adoptive parents to please stop praising or only praising the positive, happy stories but also praise those that have shared their pain because it takes an incredible amount of courage to share your pain, to share your story, the things that have happened to you, because there's been so many adoptees, like I said, in my inbox, especially now with the race issues and COVID, everything that's happening, like I cannot catch up with the comments yeah. with adoptee stories that are expressing they've got racist parents and the trauma they're feeling like it's all coming to life between race or um, just missing their birth parents and not being able to see them because of COVID. Like there's just so many things, but it's like, let's honor their stories as well as the positive stories. My goal is to bring in as much adoptive parents to listen to me so that I could tell the stories of other adoptees. And it's like, because I'm kind of like that gateway person, um, I'm afraid that they're going to shut me down. And then, who, I mean, there's, there's a lot of us, you know, that are working as adoptee advocates, but it's like, I'm afraid, you know, with the following that I have that who's going to help the rest of these adoptees, you know, if they shut me out, like who's going to be like that vehicle I hear to you. them. Yes. I've said this <laughs> so like, that's scary. to some adoptive parents, I've said directly during consultations with them, like, I am so pleased to be working with you, but I, I don't really care about you. I care about your kids. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> just tell them outright, and like many parents understand what I what I'm trying to say. Yeah. I think it's similar. Like, I yeah. care so much about the adoptees that are coming up after us, and if I, like you, can provide some education about this experience, the adopted life, that hopefully the next generation will be able to just come into their own a lot sooner than a lot of yeah. us adult adoptees who are still finding our identities. Through some of the services that I offer, like the Adoptee Lounge, which is a monthly kind of get together, so many of the folks coming through there are adults saying, I've never been in a room with only adoptees. And this feels unbelievable. Before we even start talking, and I'm, that is something that I think has got to get moved up a few decades. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And it's crazy because it's virtual. Your lounge is virtual. Yeah. But to think that it's like, we still feel like we're hopping into this virtual space, but it feels so real. Like you feel like the energy where it's like, yeah. I could be me. I could be real. These people are going to get me. I don't have to explain from A to Z you know, what it's like being adopted, you know, yes. I know when I walk in this room, when I enter this virtual lounge, that people are going to get me like this off top. Like that is the absolute most powerful feeling ever. So when I heard that you did that, I was like, oh my God, this is so dope. It is so, so unbelievable. And it's unbelievable too, that people go 40, 50, 60 years without that. Yeah. And, yeah. and we, and, and to kind of bring it full circle, going 60 years without knowing that there are other people like you, yeah. how then can you truly know your authentic self and be able to practice wellness? And I, I just think if you, so many adoptees talk about feeling like 
an imposter or having imposter mm-hmm. syndrome. Like, mm-hmm. I don't really belong. I, I'm not really me. Who am I? Those types of thoughts. Yeah. And I think it can, it can feel kind of like a jealous. I can feel jealous of others who practice self-care in ways that, that look to me like so truly uh, wholesome. Yeah. Without any like caveats or asterisks. I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> like, I, I don't know how to get there. No, my self-care is ugly. <laughs> Yes, you said that. You said that. Okay, maybe I need to understand what that means. <laughs> There's a lot of sadness, a lot of tears. So um, sometimes I'll post like, oh, going on a nature bike ride, this is self-care. But that self-care bike ride is like two hours of oh, crying and screaming because I know no one's going to hear me because I'm out in nature by myself. Um, there's just, there's a lot of sadness. And I'm still, like I said, I've been in therapy for so long, like many years, um, three years, I think now consistently, but I still find myself maybe every couple of weeks having a a meltdown crying and things like that. That's why I tell people like, it's a lot of work, but I'm doing the work. (laughs) I'm showing up every day and trying to do my part. So it's not easy. And as I say, like healing isn't linear, like my self-care or my healing is not going to look like yours. Everyone is going to be different and we have to know that that is okay. And with the age of social media and where we are today, like everybody's putting their best foot forward or their best best self forward. So, right. So their self-care might look beautiful, but you don't really know what their life is like after that photo was taken or that video was taken. Like they might log off and be crying like hell on the floor. (laughs) Like, is different for everybody. So it's like, you, you just got to focus on yours and whatever that looks like. And if it's crying, if it's screaming, if it's punching the wall, if you have to just, you know, yeah, do what you got to do, you know, but you got to put hashtag self care after that, (laughs) some photo (laughs) destroying something and hashtag self care so that we can start to see like, (laughs) this is what it really looks like. And it's okay. It's true. It's, it's beautiful. Like, (laughs) That's how we can start shifting a narrative, too. Who says you can't have a conversation about trauma and pain and still end up laughing at the end? This is how Jasenia rolls. I think it's because of the lifelong pursuit of balance in her adoptee identity, the healing and the courage to process her feelings. And I just want to thank Jasenia for doing the ugly self-care and processing her trauma. I think that work will fuel the adoptee mental health efforts going forward. If you like this episode, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts, leave a review, rate it and share it with your friends and family. Once again, I'm Angela Tucker. You can follow me on Instagram at Angie Adoptee, Twitter or Facebook at The Adopted Life or check out my website at angelatucker.com. This episode was edited by my husband, Brian Tucker. The music is courtesy of Marmoset and Artlist. Thanks for listening, and I hope to see you next week on The Adoptee Next Door.